The year is 1873, and a woman named Susan B. Anthony is on trial. On trial in New York. On trial for voting. Actually, she wasn't the only woman to have voted in the election of the prior November, 1872. A number of women had, but most of those women had not been arrested for what they did. Susan B. Anthony, who was well known by this time, was. The judge, who was no fan of woman suffrage, ordered the jury to find her guilty, told the jury what to do. Anthony's lawyer objected. It was a jury trial. So the judge just dismissed the jury, told them, you're done. You can leave now. You're finished. Then he ordered the defendant to stand to her feet, asking her if she had anything to say as to why sentence should not be pronounced against her. Susan B. Anthony was silent for a good long time. I think on purpose, silence. Then she rose to her feet and said, yes, your honor, I have many things to say. For in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my political rights, my civil rights, all alike are ignored. I am degraded from the status of a citizen to that of a subject, and not only myself individually, but all my sex are, by your honor's verdict, doomed to political subjection in this so-called republic. The judge said he was not going to listen to a rehearsal of arguments the prisoner's counsel had already spent three hours presenting. But Susan said, oh, may it please your honor, I am not arguing the question. I am simply stating the reasons why sentence cannot in justice be pronounced against me. The judge told her she wasn't to go on. She did. All my prosecutors, from the 8th Ward Corner grocery politician who entered the complaint, to the United States Marshal, Commissioner, District Attorney, District Judge, Your Honor on the bench, all alike are my political sovereigns. Not one is my peer. And even if Your Honor had submitted my case to the jury, which was clearly your duty, even then I should have had just cause for protest because none of those men is my peer. But. Native or foreign, white or black, rich or poor, educated or ignorant, awake or asleep, sober or drunk, each and every one is my political superior, hence in no sense my peer. The judge told her she had been tried according to the established forms of law. Yes, said Susan, but laws made by men, interpreted by men, administered by men, in favor of men and against women. And hence your honors ordered verdict of guilty against a United States citizen for that citizen and, uh, exercising their right to vote simply because the citizen was a woman and not a man. When I was brought before your honor for trial, I had hoped for a broad and liberal interpretation of the Constitution and its amendments, one that should declare all United States citizens under its protecting aegis. But failing to get this duty, this justice, failing even to get a trial by jury not of my peers, I ask not for lenience at your hands, but the full rigors of the law. Boom, down came the gavel. You will pay a $100 fine and all the costs of the prosecution. <laughs> May it please your honor, I will never pay a dollar of this unjust penalty. All the stock in trade I own is a $10,000 debt incurred when I was publishing my paper, The Revolution, four years ago. The sole purpose of which was to educate women to do precisely as I have done, rebel against your man-made, unjust, unconstitutional laws that tax fine, imprison, and hang women while denying them any representation in the government. And I shall work with might and main to pay every dollar of that honest debt, but not a penny shall go to this unjust claim. Furthermore, I will continue to urge all women to the practical recognition of the old revolutionary maxim that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Oh, well done, Susan, well done. And in case you're wondering, nope, she never paid the fine. She won. Oh, she got the guilty verdict, but she won. She won in the court of public opinion. People couldn't believe that judge had done what he did. Newspaper headlines, editorials, opinion pages, all were in favor of Anthony. So this case gave the suffrage movement quite a nice boost 
and it also brought them some sympathy. I am calling this program 72 Years to Women's Suffrage, because if you start with the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, that's how long it took, 72 years. And yes, I know it is utterly ridiculous to try to cover 72 years of history in about an hour. But you know, I have thought about this, and I don't think anyone could give this story the time, attention, detail that it deserves without taking about 72 hours, and no one has that kind of time. So we will try to cover a woman's quest to vote in this country in a relatively short period of time. And that means we are on the clock, and we've got to go back right now, go back in time to 1848 and the Seneca Falls Convention. Do you know that that convention, which drew 300 people and changed the course of history, it did, that convention was planned on July 9th, 1848 and took place on July 19th and 20th, 1848. Ten days. It wasn't in the minds of any of the women who planned it in June of 1848. It wasn't in their minds on July 9th when five ladies met for tea, not knowing that they were going to plan one of the most famous conventions of all time. They met for tea. And now you shall meet them. They were Jane Hunt, the hostess. She was a Quaker, and she had invited three other Quaker friends over for tea to meet the new girl in town. She had invited Martha Wright and Martha Wright's sister, Lucretia Mott, who actually was from Philadelphia but was visiting her sister Martha for a few weeks at that time. She also invited Mary Ann McClintock, all to meet the new girl in town. This woman had recently moved to Seneca Falls with her husband and three children. But when the guest of honor arrived, late, breathless, and out of sorts, instead of the predictable, formal, polite small talk, Elizabeth Cady Stanton flew in and vented. Yep, I know, that was not a term used back then. But she was frustrated and she was angry and she vented at the tea party to her new friends. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for having me. I do appreciate this, it's very kind of you. My life in Seneca Falls has been a bit, well, solitary and the change from Boston a bit depressing. Thank you very much. Well, in Boston, we had a home in town. We had near neighbors. In Seneca Falls, our residence is on the outskirts of town, roads often muddy, no sidewalks most of the way. Mr. Stanton is frequently from home. We have three children, so it all falls to me to keep house and grounds in good working order, purchase every article for daily use, keep the wardrobes of half a dozen human beings in proper trim, take the children to dentists, shoemakers, schools, or find teachers for home. My duties are so many and varied, but none stimulating enough or intellectual to bring into play my higher faculties. I, I fear I am suffering from mental hunger. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, we have books, but I have no stimulating companionship. And to add to this, since arriving in Seneca Falls, all my children have come down with chills and fevers, and this has gone on for weeks. Order, cleanliness, the love of the beautiful and the artistic, all alike have faded away in the struggle to accomplish just what must be accomplished hour to hour. Now I can understand why some women can sit and rest in the midst of general disorder. Housekeeping under such circumstances is impossible. Oh, I went on and on and on and on and on. I poured out that day the torrent of my long accumulating discontent. Okay, let's be fair. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was dissatisfied with the life that most women of her time led and expected to lead. Why should she be any different? There's an answer to that question. And part of it is a little sad. When I was 11 years old, two events occurred in my life that would considerably alter the current of my life. The first, my only brother, who had just graduated from Union College, came home to die. A young man of great talent and promise, he was the pride of my father's heart. 
Well do I remember how tenderly my father cared for my brother in his last illness, and when the time came, my father's grief was overwhelming and heartbreaking. I recall going into the darkened parlor, seeing my father seated next to the coffin, pale and immovable. As he took no notice of me, after some time I climbed upon his knee, when he mechanically put his arm about me, and we sat in silence, he thinking of the wreck of all his hopes in the death of a dear son, and I wondering what could be said or done to fill the void in his breast. At length he heaved a deep sigh and said, Oh, my daughter, I wish you were a boy. Throwing my arms about his neck, I said, I will try to be all that my brother was. And then and there, then and there, I resolved that I would not spend so much time as heretofore in play. No, I would study and strive to be at the head of all my classes and thereby delight my father's heart. When my school teacher came over to spend an evening with us, as he occasionally did, I would whisper in his ear, tell my father how well I get on, and he would tell him and be lavish in his praises. But my father would just pace the room and sigh and show that he wished I were a boy, and I, not understanding why he felt thus, would hide my tears of vexation. This was the first event. The second, the practice of law was my father's business. My father was a judge. As his office joined our house, I spent many hours there after school, listening to the clients presenting their cases, talking to the law students, and reading the laws with regards to women. One day, a woman came to Judge Katie trying to get her farm back. When she had married, it had been given to her husband, but upon his death, it now belonged legally to her irresponsible son. But my father, Judge Cady, was powerless to help this woman. United States law gave women no rights, and neither could Judge Cady. I could not understand why he could not help this woman and others like her. So he would bring down the big fat law books, open them up, show me the inexorable statutes. His law students, observing my interest, would read to me the worst laws they could find in regards to women, by which I would laugh and cry by turns. One Christmas morning, I came into the office to show them, among other of my presents, a coral bracelet and necklace. After admiring the jewelry, they began to tease me with hypothetical cases of future ownership. Now, said Henry Bayard, if in time you should become my wife, those ornaments would be mine. I could take them and lock them away and you could never see them but with my permission. Or, or I, could, I could exchange them for a, a box of cigars and you could watch them evaporate into smoke. <laughs> With this constant bantering from the students and the sad complaints of the women, my mind was sorely perplexed. Sorely perplexed. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had had what many women of her time had not had, a really fine education. And to give credit to Elizabeth, she had worked earnestly and hard to please her heartbroken father. She also read law books. But Elizabeth Cady had turned herself into quite a scholar. And Elizabeth Cady grew up and became an abolitionist. She met and admired other people who were determined to end slavery. One was a dynamic young man named Henry Stanton. Henry Stanton was a delegate to the World Anti-Slavery Conference in London. They married quickly and made that trip their honeymoon. Also in London was Lucretia Mott and her husband. Lucretia Mott had been asked by none other than William Lloyd Garrison to represent the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society at this worldwide convention. But when the proceedings began, not only was Lucretia Mott denied the right to speak, 
all the women, all the women were consigned to sit in the gallery behind a curtain. They were not even allowed to watch the proceedings. Well, Elizabeth Cady Stanton sat next to Susan. Elizabeth Cady Stanton sat next to Lucretia Mott, and let's just say they bonded. It would be eight years before they saw each other again. Eight years from the World Anti-Slavery Convention to the Tea Party. But they knew they were two women who thought alike. So Elizabeth goes to the Tea Party knowing that her old friend Lucretia Mott will be there. And what did she say? I poured out that day the torrent of my long accumulating discontent. But there was more to it than that. I poured out that day the torrent of my long accumulating discontent with such vehemence and indignation that I stirred myself and the rest of the party to do and dare anything. We decided to call a woman's rights convention then and there. We wrote the call that afternoon and published it in the Seneca County Courier the next day, announcing that the convention would be held on July 19th and 20th at the Methodist Church. Ten days. Astonishing, isn't it? And on July 19th, 300 people made their way to Little Seneca Falls, New York to attend. One was a young 19-year-old woman named Charlotte Woodward. I had seen this announcement in the Seneca County Courier. It said, a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women will be held at the Wesleyan Chapel at Seneca Falls, New York on Wednesday and Thursday, the 19th and 20th of July current, commencing at 10 o'clock a.m. Oh, this intrigued me. At the age of 19, I had been working for some time as a glove maker. As it was considered unfitting for a woman to work outside the home, we glove makers usually worked in the seclusion of our own bedrooms. The money we earned was turned over to our husbands, fathers, or caregivers, whomever that might be. Most women accepted this condition of society as normal and God-ordained and therefore changeless. But I do not believe there was any community in which the souls of some of the women weren't beating their wings in rebellion. Every fiber of my being rebelled. Sitting there all day, sewing gloves for a pittance, which, after it was earned, could never be mine. I wanted to work, but I wanted to choose my task. And I wanted to collect my wages. So I went. With a number of my friends, we hired a carriage and went. At first, we traveled quite alone, but we hadn't gone far before we saw other wagon loads of women bound in the same direction. And when we came to crossroads, it seemed that wagons and carriages were coming from every corner of the county. And long before we reached Seneca Falls, we were a procession. The Tea Party ladies, remember, were all wives and mothers. They had household duties to perform, so they did not rush off early to the church on that morning of July 19th, 1848. No, they had breakfast to fix, they had children to dress, and they got to the Methodist Church a little bit before 10, like everyone else, and were shocked to see 300 people outside the church trying to get in, and the church was locked. Oh, they had worked so hard on every little detail of the agenda that they had overlooked a little detail about the site. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton's nephew, Daniel, was there. They hoisted the boy through the window. He got in, unbolted the doors, and 300 people filed in. Because it was considered, um, well, outrageous and downright ungodly for a woman to speak in public, Lucretia Mott's husband had agreed to preside over the event. But he woke up a little sickly on the morning of the 19th and was unable to attend. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the first to speak. I'm going to read for you now a few, not all, of the Declaration, Declaration of Sentiments of the Seneca Falls Convention. Keep in mind, this was a joint effort by Elizabeth and Lucretia Mott. They had both worked on this, but it was Elizabeth who presented it. Oh yes, I was nervous, but with every word my confidence grew. 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain, you know that part, and on and on. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded of men. He has taken from her all right in property, even to the wages she earns. He has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education, all colleges being closed against her. He has created a false public sentiment by giving to the world a different code of morals for men and women. He has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it is his right to assign for her a sphere of action, when that belongs to her conscience and her God. Those sentiments were read and then immediately read again, so that lively and informed discussion could take place, and it did. In the afternoon, resolutions were introduced, but these resolutions were to be um, debated before being decided on the next day. Here are just a handful of the resolutions. Resolved that such laws as conflict in any way with the true and substantial happiness of woman are contrary to the great precept of nature and of no validity. I like this one. Resolved that the same amount of virtue, delicacy, and refinement of behavior that is required of woman in the social state should also be required of man, and the same transgressions should be visited with equal severity on both men and women. Resolved, 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 resolved. There were 12 resolutions, but it was this one, number nine, that caused people to gasp. Resolved that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. When Elizabeth had mentioned that at the tea party, all the women had said, oh, Elizabeth, no, that is going too far. We will be made fools of. But Elizabeth prevailed and it got into the resolutions. However, at the convention, it almost halted the proceedings, so controversial it was. However, Frederick Douglass, the only African American to attend the Seneca Falls Convention, spoke eloquently in its favor and it passed. Resolution number nine passed, just barely, but it passed. Lucretia Mott spoke a number of times at the convention. Because she was a Quaker and Quakers felt that men and women were equal, she had spoken in public quite a bit before and she was pretty good at it. May my statements lead you to reflect upon this subject that you may know what woman's restrictions are. In how many cases in our country the husband and wife begin life together and by equal industry and united effort accumulate to themselves a comfortable home. In the event of the death of the wife, the household remains undisturbed. His farm or his workshop is not broken up or in any way molested. But when the husband dies, he either gives his wife a portion of their joint accumulation or the law apportions to her a share. The homestead is broken up. She is dispossessed of that which she earned equally with him. For what she lacked in physical strength, she made up for in constancy of labor and toil, day and evening. Tell me, where is the justice in this state of things? Good question. Attendees at the conference were all asked to sign the Declaration of Sentiments, and about 100 people did. Why not more, as there were 300 there? Well, a number of reasons. One, some people had just come out of curiosity. Two, many women were afraid to sign. And three, the press was there, and they were there simply to report. So not everybody came to the convention in the same frame of mind, mind or with the same expectations. The responses of the press were many and varied. The National Reformer said, the first 
convention of the kind ever held, and one whose influence shall not cease until woman is guaranteed all the rights now enjoyed by the other half of creation, social, civil, and political. The Oneida Whig was not so enthusiastic. This bolt is the most shocking and unnatural incident ever recorded in the history of womankind. If our ladies will insist on voting, where, gentlemen, will be our dinners? Where are domestic firesides and the holes in our stockings? <laughs> A number of newspapers published unflattering cartoons, called the women radicals, Amazons, uh, shocking, unnatural, unwomanly, degrading, and a monstrous injury to all mankind. But pro or con, that convention, planned and executed in just 10 days, got plenty of attention and publicity. Two exciting, stimulating, life-changing days for a lot of people, and really including you and me. The Tea Party ladies returned home to their housewifely duties, but with zeal, they had a cause, they had something to work for. Other conventions soon took place also, one in Ohio, one in Massachusetts. All through the 1850s, similar conventions took place. But the Tea Party ladies were wives and mothers, and they had many duties. Martha Wright and her husband operated a house on the Underground Railroad. They gave all the time they could to this cause, but none of them could take on the leadership role. They needed a leader, and they found her, and you have already met her. Her name was Susan B. Anthony. When women vote, when the representative women of thought and culture, who are already the moral backbone of this nation, when they sit in council with the best men of the nation, who can doubt that higher conditions will not be the result? Quintessential Susan B. Anthony. Here's another quintessential Susan B. Anthony. One of the arguments against women voting was women don't have to vote, their husbands vote for them, and women influence those votes. Susan B. Anthony would have none of that. That is influence without responsibility, and that is very dangerous. Irresponsible power is always dangerous. And as for women influencing men in public life, courtesans exert far more power than the combined numbers of virtuous and pure women. <laughs> Here's another good Susan B. Anthony story. She was speaking in a half-built church once in the middle of South Dakota when a drunk wound his way through the crowd, perched on the stage, and began to hurl insults at her. The men in the audience began to shout, put him out, put him out. But Susan said, no, gentlemen, he is a product of man's government, and I want you to see what you make. <laughs> she wasn't afraid to say things like that. This was a time of great alcoholism, great drunkenness. And it really irked these women that dissipated drunkards, debased, often unscrupulous men, got to vote and they didn't. So in the same way that the abolitionist movement had taken many women to the suffrage cause, so the temperance movement also took women to the suffrage cause. And that is how Susan B. Anthony got involved. Oh, yes, yes, I'd been very, very active in the temperance movement. We'd all seen the terrible results of alcohol, how it brought people down, ruined families. No, I was willing to give my life to that cause. But uh, when I went to my first temperance convention in Albany as a delegate from the Sons of Temperance, I rose to speak and was told the sisters were not invited here to speak, but to listen and learn. At my second temperance conference, this was a state conference. I again tried to speak, and that time it caused an uproar. The third time I had not tried to speak, but it was a conference that I had helped organize. When it was over, several of the participants gathered together to write a resolution of thanks to the people who had organized it, and my name was on that list. However, when the resolution was introduced, a man rose and moved that my name be stricken out, that it was unbecoming for a convention to thank a woman, and that if I were truly modest, I would be offended by such publicity. I went home to my old, 
Quaker father and announced that from then on I would give my life to the cause of woman's rights. And then falling to my knees and sobbing, I laid my head in his lap when he gently put his hand on my head and said, If thee must, Susan, thee must. And so she did. And when she spoke in public, people uh, threw things at her, burned her in effigy, hurled insults, threatened her with weapons. These are the things these women went through for us, and some women couldn't take it. Constant humiliation like that is not easy to take. They would get in excited and enthusiastic and then back away out of fear. Anyway, Susan B. Anthony had heard about Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had heard about Susan B. Anthony. They met one day on a street corner in 1851, and they were quickly fast friends. Elizabeth said that Susan was her good angel, pushing her to work, mostly to write. Elizabeth Cady Stanton summed up the relationship this way. She supplies the facts and the statistics, I the philosophy and the rhetoric. Then we get out our pens and we write letters to the faithful, petitions to the legislature, articles for newspapers. We both knew we were doing better writing together than either of us could have done alone. Susan would bring these facts and statistics and Elizabeth would turn the information into a clear, concise, and compelling argument, and then Susan would go off and give the speech early on. When Elizabeth's nest was empty, they were both on the lecture circuit, and they crisscrossed this country time and time again, giving over 100 speeches each a year. They spoke in Europe, and they became very, very famous. They got a lot of adulation and a lot of humiliation. But despite the negativity, they made progress, if not where the vote was concerned, at least where women's rights were concerned, and especially women's property rights. But it was not an easy life. Susan B. Anthony talks about speaking in Milwaukee in the afternoon, taking the midnight train to Green Bay, speaking there, getting a six-hour train ride to uh, Stevens Point, speaking there, getting in a carriage to take her over muddy roads to speak again and again and so on and so on. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton used to say, no one thinks of uh, scheduling eating, sleeping, or resting so that we might step onto the lecture platform refreshed, smiling, and energetic. So, a lot of limelight, yes, they got that, but ease, I don't think so. Elizabeth and Susan would be the first to tell you that anything they accomplished could not have been accomplished without the help of thousands of other women, and of course that is true, and I wish we could pay tribute to all of them, but we don't have that kind of time. I do, however, want to pay tribute to a few, very quickly. Sojourner Truth. Many African-American women were involved in the women's rights movement and the women's suffrage movement, especially prominent was Sojourner Truth. And this should not surprise you because you have all heard about her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman? But I bet you haven't heard about an incident that took place in Indiana in 1858. It's quite astonishing. Sojourner Truth was very tall, six feet, maybe. She was wiry and strong, but very thin. The feminine ideal back then was soft and round. Sojourner Truth was not soft and round. This is a letter written by a man, excuse me, the hat dropped. This is a letter written by a man who attended a, an anti-slavery event where Sojourner was the featured speaker. I think it will amaze you as much as it has amazed me. It was an anti-slavery meeting, but there were a large number of pro-slavery people present. At the close, Dr. T.W. Strain, the mouthpiece for the pro-slavery side, requested the congregation to hold on. Doubt existed in the minds of many about the sex of the speaker. It was his impression that many believed the speaker to be a man. Therefore, Dr. Strain demanded Sojourner submit her breasts to the inspection of ladies present to remove any doubt. There were large numbers of ladies present, and they were indignant at such a proposition. Confusion and uproar ensued, which was soon suppressed by Sojourner. Sojourner told her audience that her breasts had suckled, had suckled many a white babe, often to the exclusion of her own offspring. Those babes had grown to man's estate, and although 
They had suckled her colored breasts. They were, in her estimation, far more manly than they, her persecutors, appeared to be. In vindication of her truthfulness, she disrobed her bosom, saying that it was not to her shame that she uncovered her breast before them, but to their shame. Yours for the slave, William Hayward, 1858. Another remarkable woman was Lucy Stone. She's really right up there with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, but she's been a little shortchanged in the history books. She was the first woman in this country to hold on to her maiden name after marriage. She was one of the first women to graduate from college in this country. She was the first woman to speak in public about women's rights. Women had spoken about issues such as slavery, but the first woman to speak about women's rights, they say, was Lucy Stone. She also published a newspaper which was in print for over 40 years, The Woman journal and it was very very successful. One more lady, Amelia Bloomer. Not only was she the first woman to give women something comfortable to wear, she too was on the lecture circuit and she could be very very funny. An argument back then against women voting was biblical. Adam had been created first, then Eve. That was proof that God wanted men to have dominance over women. Adam first, they would say, then Eve. To which little Amelia Bloomer replied, animals first, then Adam. <laughs> what a wonderful group of hard-working women, and all these women struggled for over 50 years and had to die without a constitutional amendment granting women the right to vote. Makes me teary. However, I like what Susan B. Anthony had to say about that. She said, with women consecrating their lives to this cause, failure is impossible. And indeed, a whole new generation of women were consecrating their lives to the cause, not knowing what was going to be asked of them, not knowing what they were going to have to put up with. We have been in solitary for five weeks now, so there really isn't much to report, except that the days do go by somehow. I have felt very feeble of late, fainting, so that I could hardly comb my hair this morning. My arms ached so. Oh, I don't think the fainting is anything to worry about. I think it's just that I'm not strong after all this. I hope you won't be alarmed. The women here are magnificent. Alice Paul is as thin as ever, pale, wide-eyed. She dreads the forcible feedings as we all do. Oh, I had a terrible time of it the first time. <gasps> Gasping a long time afterwards and rejecting during the process. The poor fellow who fed me got liberally besprinkled, I fear. Oh, and I heard myself making the most hideous sounds. Oh, I can't tell you what it feels like to be held prone and have someone put a metal tube down your throat. You feel forsaken. The tube has caused an irritation. It's very painful. Don't let them tell you that we take this well. We all vomit much. We think of the forcible feedings all day. We think of nothing else. The doctor thinks I take it well. Oh, I hate to think of the others if I take it well. But I really am all right. I may not be if this goes on too much longer, but I'm interested to see how long it takes our splendid American men to put up with this kind of discipline. And I'm interested to see how long it takes our president to realize that brutal bullying is hardly the way to take care of a cry for justice at home. We have told the guards here that we are making this hunger strike so that women fighting for the vote may be considered political prisoners. That's what we have told them. God knows we don't want any other women to ever have to go through this again. And thanks to them, 
we have not had to. That was a letter written by Rose, who was obviously one of the suffragists in prison. Somehow her letter got out. Mail was not coming into the prison or going out, but somehow Rose's letter got to its recipient. And now we know what it was like to be force-fed. The force-feeding, though, was only part of it. Commissioners, I am well acquainted with the conditions at Occoquan. I have had the charge of all the suffragist prisoners there, and yes, I can attest to the fact that their mail has been withheld from them. The blankets being used in the prison have been in use since December, neither washed nor cleaned. The blankets are cleaned but once a year. We officers are warned not to touch any of the bedding, and the one officer who does is required by regulations to wear rubber gloves. The rice, beans, hominy, cornmeal, cereal, all have worms in them. The worms often rise to the top of the soup. I have also seen worms in the cornbread. The women are punished by being put on bread or water for days at a time. One young woman recently was on nothing but water for 17 days, and the same young woman was on nothing but water last year for 19 days because she dared to strike at Whitaker when he was striking her. Yes, Superintendent Whitaker, that's right. Yes, Superintendent Whitaker and his son are the only ones allowed to beat the women. We officers are not allowed to lay a hand on them. One woman recently was beaten so badly we had to scrub the blood from out of her clothing and the floor. No, no, I have not actually seen a woman being beaten, but I have seen them afterwards, and I have heard their cries and the blows. To beat the women to beat the women. When I started my research, I knew the women had chained themselves to the White House fence or something, been arrested, taken to prison, went on a hunger strike, and were force-fed. I did not know that they were beaten quite regularly, or so it seems. The words you heard were those of Virginia Bovey. Virginia Bovey was a prison matron at a place called Occoquan Workhouse, which was just a few miles south of Washington, D.C. in Virginia. They called it a workhouse. It was very much a prison. I don't know what Virginia Bovey's views were about women's suffrage. Not all women were in favor of it, but God bless her for having the courage to tell those commissioners how badly those women were being treated. Virginia Bovey was a whistleblower, and we all know how risky that is. Three cheers for Virginia Bovey. We're going to go back to that prison, but first I want to introduce you to the three suffrage leaders who pretty much took the suffrage movement from 1900 to 1920. They were Carrie Chapman Catt, Anna Howard Shaw, and Alice Paul. Carrie Chapman Catt and Anna Howard Shaw had both been close friends of Susan B. Anthony, so it's no surprise that they should rise up into leadership roles. They complemented each other. They were different, but they complemented each other. Carrie Chapman Catt was a great strategist, organizer, and a wonderful fundraiser, and Anna Howard Shaw was a brilliant speaker. But the leader I want to focus on today is Alice Paul. And this is for a number of reasons. One, I think she suffered the most for the cause. Two, I think her stories are the most dramatic. And three, most historians say it was her tactics that ultimately led to, get, to women getting the vote. Anna Howard Shaw and Carrie Chapman Catt were more professional and businesslike in their approach. Alice Paul was forceful. She was never militant. She was a Quaker, so she would not be militant, but she was forceful. She felt that the suffrage cause had to be front and center at all times, and she came up with brilliant ideas to see that that would be so. One of her brilliant ideas was a parade, a parade in 1913 to take place on the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration as president. She knew there would be thousands of people in Washington, D.C. for the parade. She planned an extraordinary and huge parade. It had 8,000 participants. They had all women bands in different sections of the parade. They had women marching by, by procession, uh, pro processing by, by profession, excuse me, academics in caps and gowns, nurses in uniform. They had floats. They had living history. And they got 500,000 spectators. 500,000. 
All the press were in town, of course, for the inauguration, including the New York Times, and they gave the parade a stellar review. Unfortunately, though, it was not all fun for everybody. There was quite a file of young men making the most insulting remarks to the women. One of them pulled my suffrage badge from off my coat and nearly knocked me down. Another woman cried out because they were trying to take her two children from her. We were pushed, shoved, tripped. We had lighted cigarette butts thrown at us and we were spat upon. And these gentlemen kept repeating over and over that none of this would be happening if we would just go home where we belonged. But it wasn't just verbal assault. Many women were injured. Ambulances came and went from that section of the uh, parade all afternoon. A hundred women were taken to the hospital with injuries. So Alice Paul got the attention that she wanted and she got something else. She got sympathy. The next great thing that Alice Paul did was to picket the White House. Now, you may think, well, that's nothing new. Hold on, I've got this wrong. You may think that that is nothing special. Oh, dear. Um, picketing the White House. It was not done. You didn't picket the White House. Women had been picketing and marching and protesting for years about suffrage, and uh, we do have the right to peaceably assemble. But no one until 1917 and these women suffragists, no one had ever picketed the White House. It was just not done. Well, Alice Paul said, we will. But again, she was brilliant. She said that the women had to be silent sentinels. So there were no bullhorns, no chanting, no shouting. No, they silently stood at the White House fence with their posters and their banners, beautiful ones made in these colors, saying things like, President Wilson, how long must women wait for liberty? And that went on for months, and they were indeed silent. Then some Russian envoys came to town, and Russian women could vote. So now the signs said, the United States is not a democracy. That did not go over well, and the women were asked to leave. They did not leave, and that is when they began to haul them off to Aka Kwan workhouse slash prison. Here are the memories of one of those women who was hauled off to Aka Kwan. Her name was Mary Nolan, and she was 73 years old. It was about half past seven at night when we arrived at Occoquan Workhouse. Mrs. Lawrence Lewis, who spoke for us, asked that we might speak to Superintendent Whitaker. Just then, the door burst open and Whitaker burst in like a tornado. Mrs. Lawrence Lewis stood up. We had been sitting and even lying on the floor because we were all so exhausted. Mrs. Lawrence Lewis began to ask the superintendent that we might be treated as political prisoners when he said, you shut up. I have men here to handle you. Seize her. And several men sprang at Mrs. Lewis. A woman cried out, oh, they have taken Mrs. Lewis. Then a man sprang at me. He grabbed me by the shoulder. And I remember saying to him, I'll come with you. I'll come with you. Please don't drag me. I have a lame foot. But I was jerked down those stairs in the dark. I don't think my feet ever touched the ground, which was probably a good thing. The building they took us to was lighted as we came up to it. They took us into a very large room that emptied into a larger hall, down the sides of which were stone cells. They were all dark, and I was told they were called punishment cells. Mine was filthy. There was no window, just a little slip at the top. The only furniture was an iron bed with a dirty straw mattress on it and an open toilet which was flushed from somewhere else in the building. Uh, now, I saw Dorothy Day brought in. She is a frail girl. Two men were twisting her arms over her head, and then they picked her up and banged her down on the edge of an iron bench twice. They hurried me down the corridor and threw me into my cell. I lost my balance and fell against the bed. Mrs. Cuso was pushed in and she struck the wall. Then they threw in two more dirty mattress pads and some blankets, dirty blankets. Mrs. Cuso thought because of my age that I should take the bed. 
but we hadn't lain down five minutes when the door was opened again and Mrs. Lewis was literally thrown in. Her head hit the foot of the iron bed and she wasn't responding. We thought she was dead. We were crying out for help. Please come and help. And Mr. Superintendent Whitaker came to the door and said that if we weren't quiet, he would bring the bit for our mouths and the brace, oh no, the, the straight jacket for our bodies. We were quiet after that, too afraid to talk. Mrs. Lewis did come round. She'd only been stunned. She was not unconscious. But then Mrs. Cuso got very, very ill. She was vomiting and vomiting. And again, we cried out for help. We knew that our doctor we'd, would come. We gave them the name of our doctor, but the guards paid us no attention. We spent a very cold night that night in that drafty cell. I don't think any of us slept very much. In the morning, I was taken to the hospital cottage, I think because of my age. I don't remember much. I was in a bit of a stupor. I know that I had a large bruise on my ankle from the night before. It had been 36 hours since I had had any food, so when they brought me some, I just had to wave it away. I had not the strength. I believe that I was uh, sent home on the sixth day. Little Mrs. Mary Nolan, 73 years old, didn't have to undergo any of that. You'll hear. When she was sentenced, the judge wanted to send her home because of her age, but this is what Mary Nolan said. Your Honor, I have a nephew fighting for democracy in France. He is offering his life for his country. I should be ashamed if I did not join these brave women in their fight for democracy at home. I should be proud of the fact to die in prison, the honor to die in prison, fighting for the liberty of American women. Alice Paul, Alice Paul was the leader. Alice Paul got different special treatments. One day into my hospital room came a man who introduced himself as Dr. White. He asked the nurse on duty, does the patient talk? <laughs> I began to laugh. I said, of course I'd talk. Why wouldn't I talk? It's my business to talk. He had a stenographer with him who took down every word. He asked me to tell him about the suffrage movement, and so I did, and I think I gave one of the best speeches of my career. He listened attentively, politely, interrupting me only occasionally to say things like, but hasn't President Wilson treated you very badly? The jail abuses and the indignities, you are suffering because of his brutality, are you not? I launched into an explanation of the difficulties and challenges the president faced, and I said it was impossible to know how much detail he had of our situation. Dr. White then came forward and shone a light in my eyes, and suddenly I realized I was being examined. He wasn't interested in the history of the suffrage movement or the agitation or the jail abuses. He was interested in my reaction to them. I think he was looking for some sort of persecution mania in me. How easy it would be if I, the leader of the suffrage movement, was obsessed with President Wilson. The next day he returned with another psychiatrist and a commissioner. Again, they asked me to say everything I had said the day before, which I did, but I could tell they were there to discredit me. The commissioner said, now, these things you say about the jail abuses, this is very serious. We will be willing to launch an investigation if you will give up the hunger strike. I said, if we give up the hunger strike, will you treat us as political prisoners uh, in accordance with our demands? The answer was no. So I said, then the hunger strike will continue. And that made all of them very angry. And that is when they said, take her to the psychopathic ward. In the psychopathic ward, the nurses kindly told me what it took to send a patient to the insane asylum. The psychiatrists, too, only had to sign a paper. And at the end of the week, the patient went. I knew this was what they had in what they had planned for me. I, I had not been allowed to see family or friends. Counsel had been denied me. I was cut off from the other suffragists, and I was not even allowed to see a newspaper.
Do you know that I can honestly say I have never been afraid of anything or anyone? I have not, except for that time, except for then. I realized I was completely in the hands of the prison officials and the hospital staff. Yes, at, at that time, I was truly afraid. But she need not have been. The final evaluation by those psychiatrists was, Alice Paul is very courageous and very intelligent. And intelligence and courage are often mistaken in a woman for insanity. News of the jail abuses leaked to the press and it began to make President Woodrow Wilson look very, very bad. Finally, in January of 1918, he gave the women what they wanted, his support. It took months to get the suffrage amendment through Congress, but finally in, uh, I guess, June of 1919, there it was, the 19th Amendment. Happy ending? Of course not. Amendments have to be ratified. And the Constitution says three quarters of the states must ratify an amendment for it to be law. Three quarters of 48 states back then was 36. So, our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers and our great-great-grandmothers rolled up their sleeves all over this country to go to work and so did the opposition. The opposition was determined to defeat this amendment as they had de defeated it before. Finally, by June of 1920, 35 states had ratified, but the states that hadn't moved on it were all in the South, and the South tended not to support women's suffrage. So Washington, D.C. asked four states to hold a special session. Let's get this over with. Let's get closure on this. Three of the states said, no, we won't. We will not hold a special session. But Tennessee agreed, so all eyes were on Tennessee. At first, the women had been a little hopeful about Tennessee, but as debates and delays took place, uh, they began to worry. Legislators who had said they would vote yay were switching at the last minute. The vote took place, 48 to 48. No happy ending yet. It was a tie. Would this never end? Enter a young freshman congressman, 24 years old, named Harry Burns. Harry Burns had said that he was going to vote nay, but only if his vote were needed. Well, it was a tie, so his vote was needed, and it had fallen to a voice vote. A few days earlier, Harry had received a letter from his mother. In the letter, she said, I have been waiting to see how you stood on this issue and have not seen anything yet. Be a good boy. Vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. The voice vote began, and Harry Burns, with his mother's letter, by the way, it said lots of love, Mama. Harry Burns, with his mother's letter in his pocket, voted yay. What? The final tally? 47 nay, 49 yay. Tennessee had just ratified the 19th Amendment. They had their 36 states. Harry Burns took a lot of flack for what he had done, a whole bunch of heat. But God bless him, I love what he said to his detractors. He said, I knew that a mother's advice is always the safest advice for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. <laughs> Can you imagine any legislator today, a hundred years later, having the courage to say something like that? A lot of people think that if this amendment had not been ratified in 1920, it would have been the next year or the year after that, but don't be so sure. Do you know when women in France got the vote after World War II? Two. Do you know when women in Switzerland got the vote? Hang on to your chairs. 1971. It has never been a sure thing. Women's suffrage in the United States. What began with a tea party in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, ended with tears of laughter, joy, exhaustion, relief, and celebration. Oh, 
opponents tried to derail the whole thing. Indeed, they did. They tried to uh, discredit the Tennessee vote, tried to overturn it, tried to get the governor not to sign it, but it didn't work. Ladies were going to go to the polls. And at this point, I have to say that all those 72 years, there were all sorts of men who were devoted to the women's suffrage cause, and their support was invaluable. They called themselves the suffragettes. <laughs> All right, I'm on my way out here, but before I go, I want to ask you, do you remember the little 19-year-old glove maker named Charlotte Woodward, the one who had read the announcement in the Seneca County Courier about a woman's rights convention? Charlotte Woodward was 92 years old in 1920. She was too frail to go to the polls, but she was sharp and alert and overjoyed. So I'm giving the last word here to Charlotte Woodward, because Charlotte Woodward, 92 years old, was the only woman to have attended the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 and lived to see this historic day. Charlotte Woodward said, my heart is with all the women who will vote. And I bet it still is. Thank you very much for listening.